Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> the the third yes. class actually the usually the case first and then the first, lecture yeah. the second one. Okay, so, is that, so, so you want Matt to go first, is that right? Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Okay, oh, no problem. That's fine. Please go ahead. Go ahead, Matt. Okay. Um, so uh, camouflage and undercover. This is a, a photo of the um, patient's eye. How? So I'm trying to figure out how to... Oh, there we go. Um, so Violet is a 74-year-old lady who presented with left eye irritation um, and tenderness two weeks post-routine cataract surgery. Medical history includes polycythema and COPD. She was initially seen by a private ophthalmologist. Visual acuity was 6-9 right and 6-9 left. Lid aversion showed two separate non-pigmented conjunctival nodules. First, um, was a pink elevated nodule from 10 to 11 clock hours, which was approximately five to six millimeters in size. The second was also elevated nodule from one to two clock hours, approximately 11 millimeters in size with extension to the conjunctival fornix. Um, one could say that they were salmon-like in color or salmon pink-like in color. Um, at this time, the working diagnosis was a lymphoma, and so a CT all of it was requested. CT showed an isodense crescent-shaped soft tissue thickening of the subconjunctival space on the left side, which was not visible on imaging six months prior. Um, there was no signs of local lymphadenopathy or orbital disease. An incisional biopsy was sent for molecular pathology and immunohistochemical staining. Microscopy showed a neoplasm formed by highly atypical epithelioid cells underneath the epithelium with marked pleomorphic nuclei and irregular nuclear membrane with intranuclear pseudo-inclusions. No pigment or necrosis was seen. A PET scan was unable to visualize the left conjunctival lesion and no fluorodeoxyglucose avid lymphadenopathy or metastatic disease was identified. It was at this time that the surgical team offered surgical exenteration. Um, however, the patient declined this um, and then they proceeded with an excision of the left conjunctival melanoma with an area extending into the anterior orbit, cryothera cryotherapy, and an amniotic membrane graft. Uh, this is a slide from the main excision uh, through the bulk of the tumor. There is a small rim of epithelium at the superior of the slide with the deeper tissues, including the stroma inferiorly. There is an abnormal foci of tissue superior left quadrant of which there is a small area of intact epithelium, uh, which is visible. And to the right, there is loss of the epithelium and ulceration. The main bulk of the tumor is located in the superior left quadrant, which then trickles downwards into the deeper structures. There's a small area of, um, on very high power, there are sheets of cells, variability of the cell nuclei and irregular cellular volumes larger. Uh, then the surrounding infiltration of plasma cell with no pigment, and they was therefore amelanotic. Five months postoperatively, the patient underwent re-excision of the left conjunctival melanoma and reconstruction of the left superior fornix with a mucous membrane graft. Histology showed invasion into the orbital stroma. There was a maximum cumulative diameter of four millimeters. Oncology adopted surveillance for recurrence and a repeat PET scan at five months was negative for local or systemic involvement. One year and four months postoperatively, a repeat PET scan um, showed a hydrodeoxyglucase avid mass in the left eye, the left orbit, the liver, as well as the parotid glands consistent with local recurrence and metastasis. This is a photo at 18 months since the first operation of which um, there is pigmented changes in the periorbital area which is likely um, which is secondary from local dissemination of the melanoma
Surgical stain, Staging uses the eighth edition of the TNM American Joint Committee on Cancer Staging System. It's worth noting that conjunctival melanomas with low tumor pigmentation have been reported to be associated with a worse prognosis, but that's not, that's not included within the TMN staging system. Conjunctival melanoma is commonly treated with a wide excision non-touch technique with double cryotherapy to the margins and amniotic membrane transplant. The latter is to mitigate against symblepharon formation. Adjunct therapy includes topical chemotherapy, focal cryotherapy, or re-excision of recurrent disease and radiotherapy. Traditionally, surgical extenuation was recommended in those with extensive tumor reoccurrence or non-resectable tumors without metastasis um, to address the risk of local reoccurrence. However, it is its use is a matter of conjecture, as other studies have found that extenuation was not associated with an increased rate of overall survival. This case um, demonstrates several surgical challenges and pitfalls. First, the excisional biopsy had a risk of inadvertent tumor seeding. Um, surgical management with extenuation was initially proposed by the surgical team, but this was declined by the patient. The amelanotic conjunctival melanoma margins were not clinically distinguishable during surgical ex excision and were only ascertained on examination of the resected specimen. While surgery assists in terms of local disease recurrence, several studies have reported higher rates of local recurrence, disease, distant metastasis and disease-related survival rates in patients treated with excisional biopsy alone compared to excision in combination with adjunct therapy. It's the treatment flow diagram on the left was published in 2014. It's worth noting since then, there has been um, a movement towards immunotherapy as well as testing for the tumor mutation burdens, which um, can then further enhance um, the identification of the appropriate immunotherapy. The other learning point from this case is the importance of um, lid aversion. And then um, it's a very unusual case um, pink is a very rare case for a conjunctival melanoma, but it's important for, for as clinicians for us to keep it within our, the differential diagnosis when we're seeing such lesions. Thank you, Matthew. Um, are there any questions from the audience about this case? So this was a case with a multifocal amelanotic melanoma on the conjunctiva. Uh, it, the diagnosis was a little bit of a surprise because that lesion you might have initially thought would be more likely to be a lymphoma or maybe even a squamous neoplastic lesion. Uh, the fact that it was melanoma did make the management very difficult and this patient would have been better treated with an exenteration at an early stage uh, because that would have likely prevented the local recurrences and it is possible that it may have prevented metastases. Uh, now, as Matt says, in a lot of the published series, there's been no mortality benefit demonstrated for early radical surgery. So exenteration does not reduce the mortality. Uh, however, good local clearance does reduce local recurrence and then local recurrence is associated with metastasis. So those studies just haven't um, shown or demonstrated properly the sequence of events which occurred in this patient. Um, and that is that inadequate initial clearance will lead to local recurrence and then local recurrence will lead to metastasis. So um, this, this patient really should have been managed with exenteration to prevent uh, this outcome. Uh, there's there's no or very limited role for immunotherapy and chemotherapy in conjunctival melanoma and limited role for radiation as well. Um, do any of our Indonesian colleagues have any experience with managing conjunctival melanoma? Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Sosa. We have uh, several cases with uh, melanotic uh pigmented lesion, which is uh, a very, very, very uh, from primary acquired melanosis to malignant melanoma, we usually uh, found 
but uh, not so many. But uh, usually with pigmented uh, or melanotic uh, type. But in this case, it's an amelanotic, right, Dr. Matthew? Uh, I have no, I have uh, seen one case, but Dr. Nina, my colleague, has uh, one case uh, in the entire entire years that she uh, became an ophthalmologist. We uh, she only see she only uh, uh, saw one case. I think yeah, Dr. Nina. Probably you can uh, share uh, the case. Uh, yes. Um. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh. Good evening, Dr. De Sosa. So uh, I'm sorry, I'm, my video is not available <laughs> right now. So I have this one case with uh, amelanotic, um, um, conjunct melan uh, amelanotic conjunctival uh, melanoma. Uh, the, this, this patient was a young lady around uh, 26 uh, year old, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, she was uh, previously uh, came with um, uh, PAM, PAM, a uh, primary acquired melanosis uh, with atypia around five years uh, earlier. So it was a uh, surprise to see uh, the mass. It was it was uh, a bit uh, like uh, what Matthew has shown us. It's amelanotic and it looks uh, salmon-ish, uh, reddish uh, color with distinct um, age. Uh, but because we know this patient previously with uh, PAM with atypia, so we uh, raised our suspicions already uh, that this could be uh, um, the melanoma, the amelanotic type, and it is uh, proven uh, true. So we, what we did was we did a white excision and then uh, continue with uh, giving topical mitomycin C. Uh, last time I saw the patient was around two years after the uh, surgery, and she was doing okay. But unfortunately, uh, it was a loss to follow up uh, after that. So yeah, it was. Uh, I agree, it's very difficult. It's um, it looks a bit like a granuloma, maybe a granuloma mixed to a lymphoma, uh, because the color uh, and then the distinct age. Uh, but fortunately for this patient, because it was previously a PAM with atypia, so uh, yeah, we raised our suspicions uh, already in this case. Uh, I think that the name may have the photographs later, yeah, in the lecture, yeah. Oh, yeah. But yeah. not in your case. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So only, only one case that we found the uh, amelanotic uh, melanoma. But mostly yes. it's a uh, melanotic or uh, pigmented, yeah. Yes, and even even so, um, conjunctival melanoma is very rare. So yeah. we we won't see very many cases every year. Um, it's only I've seen probably four or five cases in total, um, and mostly in they're one pigmented. year. Uh, no, no, in in years. They're, I oh, mean, in, in years. Year we will see maybe maybe one a year. I would see, yeah. Hmm quite rare well probably uh more more cases uh we have <laughs> yes probably around four to five uh, cases per year yeah yeah well maybe uh it's also because of the uh race because we don't see um we see a lot less much much less of um uvl melanoma so in contrast we see more of uh, conjunctival melanoma than the uvl melanoma if i'm not mistaken in caucasian it's around four in one million while in uh, asian it's uh, 0 0.4 so less than one in one million for uh, the incidence of uvl melanoma but uh, for conjunctival melanoma, I think in our uh, race we see uh, more of that, but mostly uh, melanotic, pigmented. 
So, uh, Dr. Matthew, I have a question. The first surgery that you did, the biopsy, is it excisional or incisional? Yeah, so the first was a was an incisional biopsy mm -hmm. um, and then went off and did the, the second was the excision with the double cryotherapy. Oh, okay. Okay, because uh, usually um, the it's not very common to have OSSN is a uh, multifocal type, right? Uh, I saw uh, in my patient usually um, uh, solitary, but then if multifocal, usually we uh, have a uh, uh very um undisting uh, diagnosis yeah like like this case yeah probably the yes. metastasis of uh other malignancy uh, I, I, the I, eye organ also the type of yeah oh yeah and and this case is very very uh interesting and very uh, rare, but then it's like you say it's a bit like salmonish uh patch in lymphoma, right? Yes. Yep. Yeah. So probably the 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 lesson that we got from your case is whether we if you're not sure or whether is it uh malignant or probably benign we should do the excisional uh biopsy with free uh margin right yes yep. until it is proven not uh not uh, malignant yeah okay um, so is there any question from the audience to Dr. Matthew Case? Dr. Salsa, can I uh, continue with my presentation? Yes, please, if you'd like to do your presentation now. Thank you. Okay. If there's no question for Dr. Matthew, we can start uh, the lecture first. Dr. Miki, you can see, can you see my, <clears throat> can you see my Yes, thank you, we can uh, see slides? that. Yes, yes, we can see the slide perfectly, Dr. Miki. Okay, okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. First, I would like to welcome our colleague from Lions Eye Institute, Dr. Sean Luis de Sousa and Dr. Matthew Kenworthy. Thank you for participating in this uh, event tonight. Uh, for today's topic, I would like to share my experience in managing patient with ocular surface tumor. Uh, I have no financial disclosure. Thank you, Dr. Nina, for some photos and videos. Uh, our country, Indonesia, as you all know, is located along the equatorial lines, which increase the risk of ocular problems due to constant sun exposure. This is one of uh, predisposing factors that Indonesian population are more prone to develop ocular surface tumor. And recent survey at our hospital as tertiary referral hospital revealed that ocular surface was the third most common location of malignancy after the orbit and eyelids. Most ocular surface tumor cases are benign, but 30% were malignant compared to the worldwide incidence uh, of ocular surface tumor was only around zero to three cases per 100,000 people. OSSN was the most common ocular surface tumor at our hospital and the majority case around 87% uh, were invasive squamous cell carcinoma and most of them were at stage T2 or more at initial visit. And our uh, retrospective uh, five-year study uh, revealed the same uh, characteristic as other studies, uh, the prevalence around 0.9% and the 
uh, most of them are male with uh, sunlight exposure and smoking habit risk factors. And one thing that we uh, found out uh, very interesting that a uh, tumor with more than one site uh, was uh, relates or correlates with a more invasive histopathology. Uh, Oculus to face tumor is tumor that involving the cornea, limbus, and conjunctiva structures. All of these three parts are lined by non keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. Uh, how we approach a patient with neoplastic conjunctival tumor or lesion? First, we should take the a detailed history taking. Uh, is there any risk factors such as extensive sun exposure and uh, smoking habits and gender male usually more frequent than female and is there any previous history of skin cancer and is there any hiv hpv hpv or hcv infection in patient and is it uh, an xp patient or immunocompromised patient and how about the onset is it uh, slowly progressive or rapidly progressive and the changes of lesions appearance and also um, uh, notice the ethnic background. Uh, clinical signs that should be noticed are um, the quantity, like uh, the case of Dr. Matthew. Is it single or multifocal? Uh, how about the pigmentation? Is it pigmented or uh, non-pigmented? Uh, and uh, where is the location? Usually um, uh, the orbital fissure, uh, oh, sorry, palpebral fissure, or also in uh, fornic or uh, at the um, uh, tarsal conjunctiva. Is there any corneal involvement? And how about the consistency? Is it solid or cystic? Uh, is it flat or elevated? And is it mobile or fixated to the adjacent tissue? And we could do the examination by using the cut and tip with, uh, to move the conjunctiva uh, to see whether the tumor is mobile or fixated. And is there any uh, prominent feeder vessels around the tumor? And uh, do not forget to do the fundus examination to make sure there's no intraocular invasion and do the regional lymph node to see whether there is regional metastasis and do the serial documentation. The UBM and anterior OCT were very useful to evaluate the pre and post uh, treatment. Of course, the definitive di diagnosis uh, was made by histopathology examination. Uh, it is possible malignant if there is elevated lesion. Uh, if it's flat, it is a very extensive uh, pigmented lesion. And also if the lesion fixed to the underlying tissues and with a large feeder vessels. The ocular surface tumor can be classified as non-melanotic or non-pigmented and melanotic or pigmented type. Uh, the squamous, uh, sorry, the ocular surface squamous neoplasia or SSN uh, is uh, the non-melanotic type. Both types consisted of three subtypes, benign, pre-invasive, or pre-malignant, and malignant. Our SSN characteristics usually a small lesion with no subjective symptoms, slightly elevated, relatively demarcated. There are accompanying feeder vessels uh, located in interpalpebral fissure. If there is a corneal involvement, usually circumscribed, and if it's diffuse, very often misdiagnosed as conjunctivitis. And uh, this is the benign type of OSSN. This is the uh, very common, uh, the squamous cell papilloma. Uh, once you see the structure, the very unique structure, and then you will not forget this is the papilloma. And also other type, hyperplasia and uh, dyskeratosis are less common. The pre-invasive type of OSSN is called conjunctival intraepithelial neoplasia. This is the pre-invasive, uh, we call CHIN, confined to the surface of epithelium, minimally aggressive and no potentially metastasized to other organ. And uh, this is the schematic histopathological features of OSSN progression. 
the first panel represent the normal uh, normal epithelium and basement membrane in conjunctival intraepithelial neoplasia or chin a portion of epithelium is replaced by these plastic cells in carcinoma in situ a com complete replacement of op epithelium with intact uh, basement membrane if the tumor already invade the basement me membrane uh, into the stroma, then we call the invasive carcinoma. Uh, microscopic grading of chin depends on the thickness of epithelial involvement by dysplasia. Uh, this is uh, from his histopathological result. Uh, this is not clinical uh, clinical evaluation. And mild or chin one is uh, involved lower third of epithelial thickness. Moderate or chin two is involved lower two thirds of thickness. And severe or chin three is involved more than two thirds, but the surface of maturation still present. And carcinoma inside two, uh, uh, the full thickness involvement, uh, but no more uh, surface maturation. And these are various morphological type of chin, the leukoplakic type characterized by a whitish plaque, well demarcated, and papillomatous chin is very similar to conjunctival papilloma. And notice all the lesions has uh, have a feeder vessel near them. This is gelatin gelatinous type, and this is a uh, superficial corneal invasion of chin and severe chin or uh, nearly to become SCC in situ. Uh, the malignant OSSN, uh, we call it invasive squamous cell carcinoma or SCC. Uh, this is aggressive tumor that uh, already invade the basement membrane and uh, have a low metastasized potential. And all the this plastic cell completely replace the epithelium and invade the basement membrane. And the less common is mucoepidermoid carcinoma and amelanotic melanoma. Um, these are cases of invasive uh, squamous cell carcinoma that we have. This is the uh, most common type of malignant OSSN. And uh, for the second variant, the melanotic type, these are the benign lesion, racial melanosis. The one thing that we have to remember, this is congenital and bilateral. This is very common in a uh, pigmented uh, uh, person, yeah, like Indonesian people, because I have also racial melanosis. But not to worry, this is uh, no treatment, um, diffuse or patchy flat pigmentation. But uh, we have to remember this is bilateral. Uh, this is conjunctival nephi. Uh, if uh, the, the, apa itu, the characteristic is there is a cystic pigmentation. So if we uh, examine under the slit lamp, we can see the cystic pigmentation inside the lesion. Uh, then we save, is this a nephi or nephus? Yeah, and no uh, feeder vessels. And usually in intrapalpebral area. And this is primary acquired melanosis without atypia. This, uh, this diagnosis was made by histopathological evaluation. So uh, we only uh, can uh, suspect this is PEM uh, from clinical view, yeah. But uh, if there is no atypia, without atypia, then this is uh, benign and with no or low risk to malignancy, only 4% progress to malignant. And this is conjunct congenital ocular melanocytosis uh, and uh, this is also benign usually higher risk in Caucasian and should be followed uh, yearly uh, how about the premalignant the premalignant type of melanotic tumor is palm with atypia 
Uh, this is also from histopathological evaluation that we know. And this, this type has a higher risk to malignancy. And the malignant type is that we all know, malignant melanoma. Uh, most of them, 75% uh, arise from uh, PAM with atypia. Uh, the gold standard of excisional biopsy is, is excisional biopsy with no touch technique with wide margin. And now cryotherapy is considered included as gold standard. So non-invasive and invasive may be difficult to differentiate then should be treated as possible carcinoma. And topical chemotherapy uh, as a adjuvant treatment can lower the recurrence rate. These are surgeries uh, for OSSN, white excision with tumor-free margin, uh, alcohol-assisted keratoepithelectomy if there is corneal involvement, cryotherapy to resection edge and base, tumor base, and if necessary, uh, we need to do lamellar keratectomy and sclerectomy if there is scleral involvement, uh, enucleation if there is intraocular invasion and accentuation for extraocular or orbital invasion, and limbal epithelial transplantation is indicated for limbal stem cell deficiency following excision in corneal area. Uh, first, this is the white excision. Incision marking three to four millimeter for, from the visible tumor. We can also use the dye, dye substance. Never touch the tumor lesion. Hold on to the normal conjunctival tissue. When the tumor is still there, avoid over irrigation. Excise carefully along the marker using Westcott scissors or bipolar cautery until reach the limbus. Then cut the corneal margin using the resin knife. And uh, after that, excise the limbal portion of the tumor. First, uh, press firmly against the limbus to excise all limbal tumors. When adherent, uh, one-fifth thickness sclerectomy should be carried out in this area. Uh, for alcohol with four millimeter free margin using crescent knife, then apply MKA, which already soaked into absolute alcohol on the affected cornea for 30 to 40 seconds, and excise the affected cornea using crescent knife first. Then peel the epithelial layer using MKA, followed with copious irrigation after, and carefully do not disrupt the Bowman membrane. Uh, the cryotherapy, the aim is to achieve minus 21 degree of Celsius. We cryo over the conjunctival edges and the limbal and scleral tumor base if involved. It should not more than three o'clock hours limbal area to avoid limbal stem cell deficiency. Double free store technique cryotherapy will result resulted in non viable remaining tumor tissue. This technique will reduce the recurrence rate three times lower compared to the surgery alone. Uh, the defect closure depends on the size and location. Use the different instrument than previous excision instrument. Uh, after undermining, suture the remaining conjunctiva to episclera at the limbus. Um, usually we do the inner notch, yeah, uh, and suture the rest of conjunctiva to conjunctiva. Uh, if the conjunctif conjunctival defect quite large, we can use conjunctival limbal graft or fresh amniotic membrane transplant or lip membrane graft. For corneal defect, uh, we could use dried IMT or amnium membrane transplant. And we suture with nylon uh, 10O and put the bandage lens after. After excision, place the tumor tissue over the filter paper or any paper, leave it to dry so it stick to the paper and draw according to the proper anatomical orientation of the lesions. 
mark especially the ones needed confirmation for tumor free margin. Uh, these are adju adjuvant therapies for OSSN, uh, mit mitomycin C, 5 fluorouracil, interferon alpha 2B, and others like cedofovir, PDT, brachytherapy, and anti VEGF. But in our hospital, we use uh, topical mitomycin C, and uh, we still uh, uh, we still try to get approval to have the topical 5FU, 5FU from our hospital medical board. Um, these are studies using MMC, either as primary or uh, adjuvant treatment. Uh, adjuvant topical mitomycin C reduced recurrence rate compared to surgery al alone. And also this study uh, report the success rate of 5-FU topical as primary or adjuvant treatment, which is reached around 80% uh, resolution and around 10% recurrence rate. Interferon alpha 2 be also showed a high successful rate, both as primary and adjuvant treatment. AAO article mentioned about the efficacy is equal for both surgical and medical treatment. And both groups showed similar quality of life. And these are uh, several of our cases. Uh, the This is the pedunculated papilloma. We do the white excision. It's very, um, very easy because it's pedunculated. So we usually always have a free margin. Uh, only do the white excision and cryotherapy. And uh, this is the recurrent conjunctival papilloma. Uh, the, pa the patient already uh, experienced two or three times recurrences. Then we, uh, after white excision and cryo and uh, alcohol cratectomy, we give uh, three cycles of mitomycin C. And um, in at three months follow up, the patient has a good result, but then uh, usually our patient had a short follow-up time. So uh, that's a very, um, apa ya? Uh, itu ya, very sad, yeah. Uh, and this is the chin 2 or moderate dysplasia with bad excision and cryotherapy. And this is the six month post-surgery. And this is the chin three or severe dysplasia, only corneal involvement. So we did the wet excision and alcohol keratectomy. This is we only have this one case that uh, the tumor only in the cornea. Usually, uh, it's involved the bulbar conjunctiva and limbus. And this is the Chin 3 or severe dysplasia, we do the white excision, cryo, and alcohol protectomy, and this is two months per surgery. So in our study, the follow-up time is around five months. So uh, that's, that's our patient in our hospital. And this is the SCC in situ. We do the white excision, cryo, and alcohol cratectomy, and also three cycles of mitomycin C. Uh, this is uh, 14 months post surgery. So uh, very rare that our patients still come to us after 12 months. And this is invasive squamous cell carcinoma. We do the white excision. This is at initial visit and uh, last to follow up for two years, so the the tumor become bigger, and um, we did the uh, white excision, cryo alcohol cratectomy, and mitomycin C. And this patient only uh, came to us after two months follow up. And this is invasive squamous cell carcinoma. You, uh, this patient uh, refused to be exenterated or to be extended enucleation. So we did what we uh, we did what uh, we can do. Whatever, uh, apa? 
we did what we do we, we did what we can do for for this patient so we do the white excision cryo and uh, mitomycin C and for four months uh, it's quite uh, good but unfortunately the patient lost the follow-up and this is the malignant melanoma uh, we do the white excision and cryo and mitomycin C for three cycles this is only after six months follow-up and this is also malignant melanoma. This is uh, two months post surgery and still ongoing for topical chemo. And this is uh, our patient with seroderma pigmentosum. Uh, the right eye already accentuated because of the squamous cell carcinoma, orbital squamous cell carcinoma, then uh, came with this reddish uh, mass. And we did uh, the white excision cryo and amnion membrane transplant and three cycles of mitomycin C because in this case we is it, this is uh, very difficult to have a, a free margin yeah but at three months post surgery uh, the patient still uh, uh, still good. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Stop sharing. Well, thank you for that excellent presentation and uh, very nice cases there that you presented as well. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a couple of questions from the audience on the chat uh, from uh, Dr. Ferdy first. Um, I think you answered this regarding the topical therapies, but can you just go over again what you'd prefer to use for topical therapy for OSSN in Indonesia? It is mitomycin, is that correct? 0.02%? 0.04%. Uh, okay. Yeah. And, and what the, is the dose yeah. and frequency? And Yeah, the, the, the dose is uh, four times uh, for one week, one week uh, on, one week off. Uh, for three three cycles, but then uh, if there is a uh, inflame inflammation that very severe due to mitomycin C, uh, we found around one to two cases. Then we do the one week uh, in every three weeks. Uh, one week uh, on three weeks off one week on, three weeks off. But okay. then if there is no complaint, then we do one week on, one week off, 40 cycles. Okay. And do you include the lacrimal punctum when you give the mitomycin therapy or do you, um, no. you don't do that? Okay. So yeah. um, we still have access to interferon. It is very difficult to get interferon, but we use interferon alpha 2A and it's very well tolerated. Oh. Um, you don't need to take the holiday from the drops it doesn't cause the severe reactions it's very expensive yeah yeah uh, and the treatment is usually um we usually continue the treatment for two or three months four times a day um mm -hmm. depending on the response and we can also inject subconjunctivally with interferon mm -hmm. to get additional effect mm -hmm. so uh we don't tend to use five fluorouracil very much it, it it's probably in between the mitomycin and, and interferon in terms of the toxicity um and it is also in between in terms of the cost. So in many parts of the world, 5-fluorouracil eye drops are the preferred form of treatment. Um, yeah. So we have another... Yeah, because... Sorry. Yeah. Because 5-fluorouracil uh, is uh, already uh, available in, uh, in Indonesia, but then uh, glaucoma cases uh, usually use it, but then... If we uh, want to use as a topical 1%, we have to uh, get the approval by the uh, medical board. And then uh, it's a very uh, political issue. <laughs> and <laughs> and so we still, yeah, we still uh, try to get the approval. But then the mitomycin C also, it's a very... 
relatively expensive for our patient here in uh, Indonesia and only uh, only our hospital has the 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 drugs uh, probably um, not more in uh, other city in Indonesia so uh, it's very difficult uh, to have uh, like interferon to be alpha to be is very expensive and also the the usage is more uh, longer right yes probably months and right. so how, yes. how 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 much is is it cost in uh in uh well, one one eye drop no I, look i don't know what the cost is we can only access it through the hospitals again oh. the hospital will acquire mm -hmm. um but it is it is very expensive so um yeah uh, and it, uh, again in, even in australia these <laughs> these sort of um cases are best treated in the in the specialist hospital for access to these pharmacy medications mm -hmm. um so from dr is there's another question regarding um pam without atypia and whether you would consider topical um, therapy following excision. Oh. So, so benign melanosis, primary yeah. acquired melanosis with no atypia. Oh, and... we didn't. We didn't get. The, uh, we didn't uh, give the mitomycin C because uh, mitomycin C also we have a strict uh, policy to give the patient if it's not uh indicated then the uh, the apa ya, the hospital the director of the hospital did did not give us the um approval yes so it should be uh if it's carcinoma uh, minimally carcinoma inside two then we give or papilloma with uh, recurrence more than two times Yes. And, uh, yes, that's quite reasonable. Yes. Uh, and then we have one more question regarding whether it is safe to perform an incisional biopsy yep. or whether you should aim to do excisional biopsy. Um, can you can you answer that question with respect to firstly um, a large melanotic lesion and secondly a, a an amelanotic lesion that is suspicious for OSSN. Would you ever perform a biopsy before doing excisional surgery? Oh, well, uh, for ocular surface tomorrow, I didn't uh, do the incisional biopsy. So if it's too large, then um, if it's too large, then uh, and the clinical sign is uh, yeah is very obvious that it is malignant uh like we can see right from the clinical if it's very typical sign that uh it is malignant then uh, we uh do the topical chemo first to resize the tumor to become smaller and then we excise the uh excisional biopsy because uh, uh, just yesterday, I uh, no, today I got the uh, referred cases that uh, OSSN was already uh, incis uh, did the incisional biopsy from the previous doctor. So the the uh, the the edge is uh, become not clearly. So it's uh, uh, become difficult for us to do the uh, the next surgery right because if it's very distinct then we can uh very uh not easily but then we still have the we can have the uh free margin more uh more easier than if other doctors already do the incisional biopsy and then uh the uh, the border is already uh yeah uh, not clear, yeah. Yes, yes. You showed an excellent video mm. of the no-touch technique there for excision of the tumor. So that that's ideally what you would like to do. But we have another question again about very extensive melanosis. Um, and 
Look, I, I think the issue with these patients is that even before you chemo reduce them, you will need to know what the pathology is. Um, so excluding racial melanosis, for example, before you do any sort of radical surgery. But in some cases, it's not practical to do complete excision without knowing mm. a diagnosis. So in some cases, a, a biopsy is, is appropriate in order to guide the further treatment. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, but then if it's uh, multifocal, then we do the incisional biopsy because yes. uh, and also we did the CT scan, uh, orbital CT. If it's, uh, uh, we suspect that it's already in the orbit, then we only do the incisional biopsy. Uh, like in uh, conjunctival melanoma, which is, in uh, probably in tarsal conjunctiva, in the fornix, then we do the incisional. Yes, thank you. That was an excellent talk. Has anyone got any other questions? I can show you a brief case, which is similar along similar lines to um, some of yours, but maybe just to finish, if, if no one's got any other questions, I'll see if I can show you this uh, presentation. So, um, here we have a case that um, was sent uh, as an 88-year-old man initially, uh, a Caucasian man with lots of other comorbidity, heart failure, atrial fibrillation, and dementia. And it, uh, he had a conjunctival lesion which was excised, a small lesion. And as you say, you know, that the surgeon who did this did suspect invasive malignancy and did the correct surgery. So... Um, took a margin and um, it demonstrated a moderately differentiated squamous cell carcinoma. So a little bit of a surprise and there was residual disease there. So a couple of months later, went back and did a further excision, um, took out the base and performed a biopsy. And there was a no additional malignancy seen at that point and cryotherapy was given. Um, Incidentally, this patient had had a basal cell carcinoma in the same eye before. That's that's not relevant, but that was there before. So then um, following that initial excision, later that year, he represented with this type of change in the conjunctiva and a biopsy was performed again. And this showed neoplasia, which was involving conjunctival crypts. So not fully invasive. This was full thickness um, dysplasia or SCC in situ, if you like, but extending into the conjunctiva deeper, but clinically looking very suspicious for becoming more aggressive. And this was about the time of COVID. So he was a little bit lost to follow up and then represented with these nodules, um, which were biopsied and these demonstrated squamous cell carcinoma. So uh, this was a 90 year old man. He was referred to me for exenteration, or, I mean, we, we could consider doing an extended enucleation in this case. Um, does anyone have any other suggestions about what other treatment could be considered? So we did some staging examinations uh, with a, a CT scan. Radiotherapy is the patients with invasive squamous cell carcinoma, and uh, we have access to radiotherapy, but it's not very good for lesions in this area. Based on the CT scan, this was a five millimeter thick squamous cell carcinoma. So with external beam uh, radiotherapy, what we have available in Perth, we would have had to have given him akinesia for 10 days of external beam therapy, uh, which means doing a peribulbar, a retrobulbar block every day for 10 days so that the radiotherapy could be delivered accurately. Uh, we do have some brachytherapy plaques, which are used for choroidal melanoma. And we could have applied a brachytherapy plaque probably for about two days. But when we put those on the surface of the eye at the limbus like that, um, that would require a gen with an anaesthetic. He'd have to go to the operating theatre and he is on anticoagulants for his atrial fibrillation. Um, and then the eye doesn't close very well over the top of those plaques. So you can get corneal melting and corneal ulcers and problems like that. So neither were particularly good options for him. Uh, but this is what has been done more recently in other parts of the world using immunotherapy to shrink these type of lesions. And the agents that are being used are alpha um, interferon alpha 2, uh, A or B. And um, certainly around the time of COVID, a lot of uh, places 
were using these type of treatments instead of doing surgery. And in many cases, they can turn lesions that are inoperable into lesions that can be operated on. So he was given a course of interferon alpha 2A, which is what we had. Uh, and the dose was 2 million units. And it was given as subconjunctival injections around those masses uh, for four doses, one dose every two weeks. Mm -hmm. And um, this was the response uh, following treatment at six mm -hmm. months. So mm -hmm. complete response clinically. He was over 90 years old by now and he'd gone into nursing care. So uh, we didn't repeat any any staging, no further imaging or anything like that, but it did not look like there was going to be any recurrence. And this was uh, now 12 months post-treatment with no recurrence. So uh, mm -hmm. I just wanted to put that up just to show you some of the newer agents and the newer things that we will be thinking of using for these type of uh, conditions that previously would only have radical surgical options. And this certainly applies to our management of um, cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma now, uh, where, where lesions that are very difficult to manage surgically can be significantly reduced with immunotherapy and in many cases go into remission uh, without requiring any type of surgery or making the lesions small enough that you can then perform uh, a, similar, a smaller resection. So yeah, as you were saying, even for those large ocular surface um, squamous neoplastic lesions, if you give the chemotherapy first, you may be able to shrink the lesion and then make it possible to do surgery. Or in some cases like this, you may be able to avoid doing surgery at all if that's appropriate. This is... no. Okay. Um, does anyone have any other questions? We're nearly at time now. Um, I think we've answered all of the questions from oh, the chat. Question, there's... if I may, Dr. Sosa. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah, one quick question. When you do the intralesional interferon uh, alpha 2B, um, did you do, it looks like a multifocal lesion, right? Uh, the case you just showed us. Yes. So did you put it uh, in both or in all of the, or where did you oh, put it? No, it's very easy to put in the subconjunctival plane and it spreads uh, all the way across that area. Mm. And it it seems to have a more more of a diffuse effect. It's it's more immune modulating. It's not mm. really treating just where it's injected. It causes an immune response that that acts even a little bit more distant. So it's it's very good um, treatment, you know, for these type of lesions um, mm. in the ones that respond. Now th th there are there are some several series around. No one's done any very large trials with this with these agents. That response rates seem to be very good but I can't tell you exactly what they are. Yeah, excellent result. Thank you for sharing it to, to us. It's and something to think about. I mean, these are very expensive medications, but mm. in, in, in all fields of, uh, of cancer biology and, and, and can cancer chemotherapy, we are having lots of new things. And in a few years, I'm sure they'll be available more widely um, and they, they will make um, give some other options for these patients. I think there is one one question that still not be an, not be answered. Um, dari Dr. Andy Marsha. If the pigmented lesion is extensive from the limbus, uh, based your on your experience, should we do the excision in separate surgeries as excision of all lesion in one step surgery may increase risk of LSCD? If so, how long should the interval be between each white excision surgery? Uh, I think, Dr. Sosa, do you have a patient uh, in 360-degree tumour in Australia? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> no, look, I mean, th this would mainly be a, a, a melanocytic lesion. And it, with a very extensive involvement like that, um, it would be very difficult to do any surgery yes. and protect the limbal stem cells. And even with the topical mitomycin following that, limbal stem cell deficiency may be a real problem. Yeah. Um, but these these are lesions that might become life-threatening and threaten the eye. Should, um, and, should yeah. be accentuated. That's right. <laughs> and and the endoclusion. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So that that that's the problem, uh, but again, this is one of those situations where you need to to at least do a biopsy to prove what type of pathology is there uh, mm. before considering treatment. 
but it may be somewhere where if you wanted to try the mitomycin initially to chemo reduce the lesion, um, sometimes PAM um, without atypia will resolve quite nicely with mitomycin therapy and leave a very small area that looks like it's invasive. Mm -hmm. and, and then perhaps you may have a smaller um, lesion that is surgically treatable. Oh, so you also uh, give the uh, chemo for PAM without atypia? No, 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 no. Oh, but with in, atypia. In like this, yeah, in a case like this where it's 360 degrees. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So where, how much of it may be atypical? Yeah, there may yeah. be parts of it that will regress completely with topical treatment. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah Dr. Andy Marsha <laughs> already answered. Okay. Thank so, you, you, Dr. <laughs> okay so thank you everyone thank you all for attending and um thank you to our presenters today for some excellent talks there and um i hope to be able to join you again in the future okay good evening doc. good evening everyone to conclude our session i would like to conduct a photo session together so i would like to invite everyone to open up your camera please Okay, we will begin the photo session shortly. Okay, everyone give us your best smile. One, two, three. Okay, second page. One, two, three. Third page. One, Two, three. Fourth page. One, two, three. And last one. One, two, three. Okay, that will be all, Dr. Sosa. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you so okay, much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very Dr. much, Dr. Sosa. Dr. Matthew. Thank you. Hope we can see again yes. in yes. the future. Bye. Bye bye. Yeah. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Bye. bye.